This could be a little awkward for me and maybe for you in that uh, it's a talk I've never given before. And so I don't have the crutch of my PowerPoints, um, nor the sort of comfort of what I normally talk about, which is a, for folks who haven't had a chance to talk with me, usually a techno-optimistic rant, right? That's what I like to talk about. I love, uh, as a venture capitalist, to meet exciting entrepreneurs and get a chance occasionally to back them and see their dreams become reality vicariously. But I don't directly do anything productive, right? I, uh, it's people like Rodney Brooks, who you heard from, right, who are reinventing robotics to hopefully eliminate um, you know, meaningless work from humanity, or folks like Elon Musk, who many of you know, that wants to colonize Mars and replace all gas-burning cars. Big, audacious goals, big X's. The X's I'd love to talk about and normally do. I normally evangelize their successes. Or even Craig Venter creating synthetic life in the whole synthetic biology domain. But in our business, uh, we often need to be a bit more meta or a bit more abstract. We look for patterns across companies, across industries over time. And so that's sort of the filter I'm always using day to day at work. It what's what leads me to my techno-optimism, and then lately led to me have a bit of a despair on a subject I want to uh, talk about, but then circle back to hopefully some hope. So on the kind of blue sky thing, I, I think there might be a problem here. I'd love to get feedback on whether the problem is real or illusory. Um, I don't know if there's any good solutions, and technology may be the cause of the problem in indirect ways, and hence the way in which we develop and think about technologies and their deployment and the effects on culture and society could be important. So with that preamble, um, let me just start then again, just so that you believe me when I, I say my normal thinking pattern is positive, to, uh, to show the Moore's Law slide. Do I push a button to put that up there? Yeah, I'm just going to leave this up here. Um, it was shown earlier in one of the talks about what's next after the integrated circuit. But for anyone not familiar with it, I just want to make sure it just sort of seeps into your consciousness, because I think it's the most important graph in all technology business. And it is a setup for the subject I'm about to discuss. Um, Logarithmic scale, so think of this as a straight line as an exponential across technologies going 110 years exogenous to the economy. Right? So those are the main points I want to mention is that our capacity to compute has been compounding for 110 years with people not even knowing they were on the curve. And it begs the question, uh, more generally, why does technology accelerate progress? I, mean, I think technology is synonymous with progress. It, it's, it's the engine that creates economic growth over time. Might it continue to accelerate? One reason you'd think so is, well, heck, if it's been for 110 years, why not 20 more? The second would be the, the, the simple framework that all good ideas, all innovations, all technologies are combinations of prior technologies. And if that's true, as described by a number of writers, uh, Ridley and Kevin Kelly and uh, Stuart Kaufman and some really good books a couple years ago, if that simple premise is true, then think about the set theory. If you have n ideas in the world at any given point in human history, and in prehistory they may not have been written down, they may have been localized, they weren't global, but if you have n ideas and you add one, add two, add three, the number of possible subgroupings grows as Reed's law it goes two to the n, right? It is a really powerful dynamic. It's perhaps why in the domain of ideas and technology we have accelerating change and may always have accelerating change. Now that is sort of the underlying premise of my positive view of the world and that's why I start with it because it led to a debate once with Peter Thiel who's a contrarian investor um, and a libertarian by philosophical bent and, um, and he takes some pretty controversial uh, points of view that I just really don't agree with. One of which is Moore's law is a lie and there's no such thing, which shocks me, being as the fundamental premise of everything I uh, talk about um, and everything I invest in. He's like, no, last 35 years, yeah, yeah, you may have had some refraction on the you know, whatever transistors, who the hell cares, right? How about if it were true, then technology induced innovation and progress should have improved human welfare. And over the last 35 years, the median wage in America has been flat. So as the vanguard of techno utopian advancement, why is it that the median wage is flat? Therefore, Moore's law must not be true. So I immediately thought there's a, causal correlation argument here that I really want to say, why would that jump to your mind is the conclusion. Right? It seemed obvious to me that you'd want to look globally, right? Offshoring, a lot of obvious reasons why our wages may be affected by things that are not just US centric, first point. Second is median, right? Hello, what about the rich poor gap, right? The elephant in the room, how about just the average, right? And uh, it seemed to me that that describes something more fundamental. And, 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 and it is a thing I want to address now today for the first time, which is just some forming thoughts around might we, in all the technologies we build, accelerate a rich poor gap? And if so, is that okay? Will society transition just fine? Will there be some rough spots? And what does it look like on the other side? So the argument in simple would be Moore's law is not that it's not true. It's in fact causing some of these phenomena that economists are worrying about. Now, what would be the, the, the argument for why this might be? Well, it's, it's quite simple, really. It's that we're in a network economy, and it's a winner-take-all dynamic. Right? You look just all around you in technology businesses, it doesn't tend to support thousands of competitors as much as it tends to 
create sort of attachment effects. The more social the technology, more communicative the technology, the more it tends to be a one winner takes all kind of prize. You see that at all kinds of fractal scales throughout the economy. In fact, um, you might argue, or I might argue, is it never going to be self-rectifying? So that's the thought experiment. What if whatever we think is going on, whether or not the data supports, whether or not economists really agree on all the underlying factors, might it just continue to accelerate? And uh, so, of course, you are aware at a fractal scale how this is somewhat the case today. So consider nations, again, over Peter Thiel's time frame. Um, you know, GDP per capita has gone up globally about 7x. But the gap between the top 20 nations and bottom 20 has also diverged, 2x. Right? So it's not a rising tide lifting all boats equally. Or consider companies, right? Google, Apple, others in the internet domain. The closer they are to information technology, the more rapidly wealth creation seems to be occurring, and perhaps the more concentrated that it is. Right? It used to take a lot of hard work, decades of conquering industries and stuff for the robber barons to make a billion. Here, yeah, a few, few years of good work. Billionaires all around. It's cropping up in Silicon Valley. And I've known a lot of these people before they became billionaires. And we'll get back to that later on how that affects your psyche when it's instant riches. <laughs> then, of course, at the level of individuals, right? So within economic strata, there's a power law, right? So, you know, the power law of, that you see in network attached, like, like a network effect. Anywhere you have network effects, you have power laws. And income distribution is that way. Um, you also know, of course, about extreme nodes at the top, the Bill Gates of the world who have more personal wealth in many countries have GDP. Um, you have um, other interesting effects going on, obviously, with a lot of the discussion for the first time, at least more popular culture, but the 1%. Right? And you all had seen so many graphs that we didn't even want to show them. Right? Just pick your favorite that you've probably seen. And uh, the latest data I saw was that 93% of all of the most recent year's data for which they have it uh, of um, income improvement was in the top 1%. Right? Which is kind of interesting. Now, I gotta pause for a moment, and this is where this gets awkward, because like when I hear things like this, it's it's kind of like seeing the slaughterhouse picture. It's, it's, I just don't want to somehow I just don't want to admit or, or or look into it that much, because it just doesn't feel quite right, fair or egalitarian, and um, it doesn't seem like polite company uh, conversation for some reason. I, I don't know why, and so that's why I wanted to talk about it. So, what's the problem with it? Well, one is we all know happiness correlates with disparity, not your absolute wealth, but the disparity in that around you. And in a global citizenship, I'm not sure if scenes of wealth elsewhere really affect you as much as your neighbors, but certainly in local communities when there's wealth disparity, you have unhappiness. You have um, a sense of detachment and estrangement, almost in a marketing sense maybe, but in a modern version of that. And you have some unusual side effects, like Sam Harris has noticed from a variety of studies that the incidence of religion, our last subject, um, correlates pretty perfectly with income disparity both between countries and within countries. And it's one of the only ways you can explain an otherwise peculiar graph correlating national wealth and religiosity uh, that the Pew study has done. But the outliers, like the United States, are, of course, the most income inequal places on the planet, right? And China's rapidly following us. So it seems like the modern economies go through this information age conversion, and they become much more, uh, a much larger rich-poor gap, and in, in China's the experiment underway. One other sort of perhaps related subpoint is that the modern technologies of the day are a bit of a black box for the average person, right? It's the rare example like the inflatable robots that you can get your hands on or the car you could tinkle with. It's down in the chips, inside the chips, the gate oxides, the nanotechnologies, the synthetic biologies, which are great for the scientists working in it, and I love those subjects, but the average person maybe in the street doesn't feel any kind of connection to the technologies that are defining their world and shaping the fabric of society. That's a different kind of estrangement. It's almost like a cognitive separation, those who know and those who don't, about the world they live in, like fundamentally what drives their lives. And is that empowering to not know anything about what's going on around you? And lastly, I kind of wonder then if you do opt out. In the past, thousands of years ago, you could opt out. You could kind of go Amish and, hey, life is fine. At the scale of countries or individual careers, I'm not so sure that's a good idea for a 10-year period or a 20-year period or even a five-year period if ultimately you decide you want to go back. Right? If you kind of want to really compete on a global scale now in a way as a country, individual, or company, if you sort of get off the, the cutting edge of what defines technology and therefore economic growth. It's kind of as if the um, sort of the sea of, of, uh, of um, uh, oh, the sea change of, of destiny is now at the drumbeat of decades instead of uh, centuries. So you always think about the pyramid, right, and the bottom of the pyramid. And so uh, I don't think that's the right visual. Right, because that kind of implies something like a triangle. What if it's a conical spike and it's over time going like this? 
where fewer and fewer are making more and more. If that mental model, if you keep that in your mind, you say, well, how does technology relate to that? Well, it certainly raises the bottom of the pyramid, right? There are a lot of happy people with smartphones in the world now who didn't have them a while ago. So there's many arguments why, hey, everyone's better off, and that is true. Right? There, uh, there's a great uh, comment by Larry Summer that if you consider from 1820 to, um, uh, excuse me, from the time of Pericles to 1820, the average standard of living in Great Britain went up 2x. Then during the course of just 50 years in the Industrial Revolution, it went up 2x. And now the average standard of living is going up 2x every five years in China. That's his quote. Um, it's staggering. So it raises from the bottom up. Technologies like smartphones going to the next three billion people who don't have them. Crowdsourcing so they can tap into a global economy. Um, MOOCs, so they, they have massive online courses, so they can educate themselves in a fair, democratic way. This is how technology raises everyone. But the irony is twofold. They are now in a global economy. They're visible. The rich poor gap, who are they comparing themselves to? Secondly, the idea space. Remember that combinatorial N to the N thing in Reed's Law? You now have three billion new minds coming online who weren't online before, contributing to the global idea space, which, as Peter Diamandis points, is one of the most fundamental reasons why you think we're entering a period of hyperabundance in his, in his optimistic future. And I believe that. You're going to have more innovation coming from more places on Earth with less transaction costs on where they can both source and reach customers and investors and build a business like never before. Those, are, those costs are going down. But that also means, potentially, if we believe that's the source of accelerating change, we're going to have perhaps even a further rising of the spike. Or not. Maybe we won't. Maybe idea space correlates perfectly with humanity. In other words, more people, more ideas. It should be in balance. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. So lastly, I think there's some philosophical questions separate from how our technologies help or accentuate this. It's how do we want to co-evolve with our technologies as a society in the memes, cultures, and in ways in which we think we should live our lives, everything from economic policy to uh, what seems fair, right, our morality. Think about the philanthropy uh, wave, you know, Bill Gates and the, and the pledge to give. These kinds of activities are relatively new, relatively strong, and I think they occur most in people who have come upon riches quickly, where they realize that on a risk versus skill balance, they had a lot of, or risk versus, uh, excuse me, luck versus skill, they had a lot of luck in life, right? They got lucky. Those people in my rough correlation seem to give quicker. And people who worked their whole life on something tend to attribute it a bit more to skill and hard work, and they tend to have almost a libertarian perspective that people who don't have as much as them didn't work as hard or didn't have as much skill, and that somehow that's okay. Um, the, that meme may take the pressure valve off of disparity, that if you people who are at the top of the spike give it all away and that, that idea catches on, eh, maybe that solves the problem, oh, if, if there is even a problem. Um, I guess I think there is a problem. I shouldn't downplay that. Um, and then secondly, you know, can a corporation play into this? You look at you know, someone like Bill Gates who does a Microsoft, then shifts gears in life to do their nonprofit and philanthropy, right? Two different modes. You look at other people like Steve Jobs, who unfortunately never got to phase two. How can a company do good? How can employees within a large company do good? And it becomes a question of governance, right? How can Google do good everywhere for everyone without having to wait for another phase? How can you, in a modern corporate governance, obviously voting shares, benefit corps, a lot of experiments going on. Of, of the last four companies I've invested in, half of them want to have a mission like that, actually, actually half the last six, where making money is only a byproduct of something really big, like colonizing Mars or, or uh, providing daily imagery for the whole planet so the NGOs can have that. And, and, and making money, they really want to make sure that doesn't get uh, hijacked in the future. And the last two philosophical questions that I think it raises is, what's the nature of work when everything is a services industry, information work, there is no need for mechanical labor, no need for agriculture unless you want to do it as a hobby, right? Think about 500 years in the future if, if you think that's uh, uh, too far out of an idea. What does the bottom half cognitively of the world do for a living? Is that fine if it's something you know, less productive than others? Would you want income to go in a power law in that kind of a future? How does capitalism adapt to that future world? And, and I speak as someone who's benefited entirely from the golden goose of options, the alignment of incentives, right? And does that model naturally migrate to that kind of a future? And lastly, um, what does it really mean for the American dream? We all it, and I mean that in the most metaphorical sense. Everyone wants to believe that they, through their own activities, could rise to the top. And technologies make that easier than ever for anyone in that pyramid, in theory, or spike, however you want to look at it, to rise to the top. But what if only a tiny fraction of people ever can or will? If that's true, does that sort of, uh, in some ways, undermine the viability of the American dream? And how can we fix that? I think that's the elephant in the room in a lot of political debates that people don't just talk about directly. 
uh, about tax policy, about what's right, what's wrong. And I think as technologists, we're as much a part of it as part of the solution, part of the problem. They're all intermixed. And how do we want to live our lives in this technology accelerating future? Thanks. Thank you.